Very good. So the first thing I'd like to say is what an honor it is, Professor Barber, to have you on our campus and here in our Center for Middle East Studies. Thanks so much for taking some time out of your very busy global schedule to sit down and chat with us. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you again. You were recalling that we were together about 10 years ago in Selma Gundy at a conference, and we've right. shared other occasions, not necessarily at the same time, but at Reset and, and other places. So it's great to be here on campus at the University of Denver and with you. Where you have uh, former students, uh, including uh, my colleague Micheline Ishai, who you'll be seeing soon, mm -hmm. And, uh, and other uh, former students of yours who are in other parts of yes. Denver doing great things. So the Barber Archipelago <laughs> is, uh, is alive and kicking. So uh, Professor Barber, you're a major democratic theorist. You've been writing about democracy for something like 30 years now. And um, I'd like to just ask you, uh, what are your thoughts at this moment about the state of, call it what you will, the Arab uprisings, the Arab Spring, the Arab revolts, the Arab counter-revolts. Yeah. Where are we from the point of view of democratic theory and the hope right. for democracy at this point in the history of this rather momentous turn of events in the Arab world? Well, there are two things to be said. First of all, there is a straightforward historical perspective. And the reality is you can't fight history. The history is that for whatever reasons, a revolutionary movement emerged. It led to the overthrow of the military dictatorship. That led to an election, which in turn brought the Brotherhood to power, and that in turn led to further unrest that reintroduced the military, overthrew the Brotherhood. You can't really, although I think we'd all like to as social scientists, evaluate history by what you wish had happened or what maybe shouldn't have happened. I mean, the fact is, that happened and the most, the purest moment in a sense was the inaugural moment when young people in the square, in Cairo, in Alexandria and in Tunisia and throughout the Middle East said finally enough. We want an end to generations of servitude excused by the opposition to foreign domination and colonialism but in fact an excuse for local Tyranny. And that was an extraordinary moment. It was a moment, I suppose, like 1789 uh, in, in Paris or 1917 uh, in Petersburg. It, it, was, it was a moment of genuine inspiration and hope. But what we also know, to move away from the historical phase, is that there are conditions for the unfolding and evolution of democracy. And the tragedy is that though the uprising took place with genuine and authentic fervor, the conditions for a transformation of Egyptian, of Middle Eastern society were not yet in place. And in that sense, the revolution seems premature and has had consequences which uh, are not what anybody wished. The first and I think simplest lesson to be learned from all of these revolutions, whether you're talking about uh, Libya or uh, uh, Egypt or anywhere else, around the Mediterranean is that overthrowing tyranny and establishing democracy are two fundamentally different things. And I think particularly in the West, actually, our sense is if you overthrow a tyrant, democracy springs up. Right. It's like if you get rid of the weeds in the desert, you get a lawn. <laughs> actually, if you get rid of the weeds in the desert, you get a desert. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and growing a lawn is quite different. And a lot of people think and thought that by overthrowing a uh, Gaddafi or overthrowing a Mubarak or overthrowing a military dictatorship, that very act would kindle a new democratic society. And it just doesn't work that way. It's not just, that's not just the Arab spirit, it's the French Revolution, right. which right. overthrew the monarchy, led to, a rest, led to Napoleon and then the restoration of the monarchy for almost another 75 years. The overthrow of British rule in North America led to a slave republic. And it took another 80 years and the Civil War to overthrow slavery. So the notion that the initial impulse to overthrow tyranny will create democracy is simply misplaced in both our own history and the histories of other people. And that historical perspective, I think, is really important for people to bear in mind as they evaluate the state of the Arab world today. And to remember to a lot of people say, well, that just shows the Arabs weren't capable of or weren't up to it. Well, I guess the French weren't capable and up to it. And I guess the Americans weren't capable and up to it. It takes, I mean, the fact is, and here's number two, democracy takes 
time. I like to remember that uh, 1215 was Magna Carta, and we didn't get the Dolores Revolution until 1688. We didn't get suffrage until 1848. We didn't get women's suffrage until 1911. I mean, it took about 700 years for the British to figure out how to begin to get there, and some say they're still not quite, <laughs> quite there. I mentioned already that the U.S. Republic was founded on slavery. It took 80 years to move beyond that. The Swiss uh, had their first inner cantons meeting uh, in the 13th century, and women got the vote in 1961, completing, in a sense, the democratic transfer. So democracy takes time, and it takes time for good reasons, and this is something that I don't blame folks in the Middle East for not getting. I blame those who encourage them in the West for not getting. You build democracy, not top down, but bottom up. You build, you educate citizens, you create a civil society, you create civic institutions. On that, you build a spirit of democracy that then can take the weight of democratic institutions. Then maybe you put in a parliament and, a, and a, an independent court. And finally, as the last, not the first step, you have elections. But the West encouraged them to do the opposite. Right. Have your revolution and then right away have elections. Right. I'll never forget in Iraq, we'll all remember it, the Purple Fingers. Yeah. It was a beautiful moment. Inspiring. It, inspiring because a lot of Iraqis thought, all right, bump, I voted. Right. But of course that's been followed by chaos and anarchy and tribal war and the breakdown of order, the breakdown of civil society. Because if you have elections in the absence of citizens, mm. you get at best a monopoly of violence, a legitimate monopoly of violence, the triumph of one sect or another over another. And the, again, the slow road to democracy takes a whole lot longer. So bottom up, not top down. And inside out, not outside in. I sometimes think Americans and Europeans think you can FedEx the Bill of Rights <laughs> you know, to Baghdad or to Cairo, and you're going to have rights, and you can ship over the a Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, and that somehow is going to amount to liberty. And people have to build their own institutions, their own civil society. They have to find their own way to civic institutions. What's sad, in a way, is that in Afghanistan, which in many ways isn't even a nation, let alone a democratic nation, the most democratic institution there is, God knows, not the presidency, but the lawyer Yerga, mm -hmm. which is a traditional tribal council that allows the otherwise battling tribes from time to time to meet, coalesce, and try to hammer out a kind of consensus that allows the tribes to live together. So they're an internal uh, institution, which we never paid much attention to, probably held out the best hope. Right. So, Inside, from the inside out, not from the outside in, from the bottom up, not from the top down, slowly building education, the civic institutions, not top down. I'll never forget after the American uh, invasion, the arrival in Baghdad of American troops. The first things our tanks did is they parked outside the oil ministry, the munitions factories and what so on. What message did that send? The museums. The schools looted, looted all the stuff taken away. They're still trying to find the stuff, and return. Not a priority. And yet, that was the essence of civil society. The first thing you do if America wants to say we understand democracy, you put your tanks in front of schools, you put your tanks in front of museums, in front of art galleries. You protect the civic institutions. Don't worry about the oil. We'll come to that later. But we didn't do that, and then we sent the wrong message, and we also allowed what was a, a semi-developed civil society in Iraq to be manhandled and destroyed. So the result is a kind of tragic situation in which people take a first glorious strike at trying to create democracy and then come away not really understanding the conditions for democracy, deeply disappointed in democracy. Mm -hmm. And the real danger to me is that in places like, like Cairo or uh, in Damascus or uh, in other parts of the Arab Spring, people will go straight from spring to winter. With As no Rami summer. Khoury says, the Egyptians following the great democratic theorist Jim Morrison of The Doors, we want the world and we want it now. We want it now. And when we don't get it now, then that world can't be worth having. And then you turn your back on it. And of course, the, the sadness of uh, a youth movement that took its life in its own hands and sacrificed life to get rid of the army thinks they can work with the army to oust an elected Muslim Brotherhood president who however much he abused power and so on. And by the way, in the Ukraine, the same thing is happening. I mean, again and again, you see people talking about this illegitimate, this terrible, this corrupt president, except for one thing, he was elected that by little the detail. Ukrainian people, you know, and, and, and it is, I mean, the Russians there, 
though, however corrupt he is, he's, we've had a lot of corrupt presidents in the West too, he was elected by the people. And you, if you think that the response to someone you elect who's corrupt is to overthrow them by force, then clearly you don't understand democracy and Ukraine has that problem today. What you're saying, I think, is enormously illuminating and gives great perspective to the events of the last few years. I'm thinking, I'm wondering, wh how would this apply to the case of Libya, a case that you've mm -hmm. been involved with? You met Colonel Gaddafi, you talked to him, you were part of a dialogue. Of and, and more importantly, with his son. Safe, with his son, Safe, Safe that's right. And with others who were working on a constitutional reform, who were working on the development of civil society. Human Rights Watch in 2010 actually went to Tripoli and released their first report in Tripoli, right. saying for the first time ever, Libya had made more progress on human rights than anyone else in the northern Mediterranean and so on. That all happened, and his son in particular, who was writing two books for Oxford University Press, who had gotten a PhD in civil society studies at the London School of Economics, was working really hard on reform, along with a group of constitutional lawyers in Libya who I, who I, I worked with. And you were and far from alone in this regard. There were a group of intellectuals, a including lot of, Anthony a lot of Giddens, people, a lot of including people. David Held, Joe Nye. Right. Who so, worked in the Clinton administration, lots of others. They kind of vanished overnight when some of these things, when the, when the going got tough there. But look, again, same thing. You can't gainsay history. The reality is, even as he moves slowly in a positive direction, even his son, as his son tried to move towards greater democracy slowly, the Arab Spring meant that things got out of hand very fast, and in the end, they killed a tyrant. And he was a tyrant, and he lived by the sword, and he died by the sword. And you can't lose, uh, you can't lose too many tears over that. But again, as happened elsewhere, by removing the tyrant who was the stabilizer, who had done more or less everything the West had asked, he got rid of weapons of mass destruction, he had opened uh, the oil market to the West, he had freed the foreign nurses and the uh, doctor who had been captured in Benghazi by his opponents. Uh, he was moving towards rights, he was allowing the internet and so on. He was on a very slow path, clearly too slow once the Arab Spring happened for an awful lot of people. But once he disappeared, mm. what happened unfortunately was that you got not the emergence of a full-blown national democracy, right. but the disintegration of Libya into its tribal and militia pieces, the re-emergence of Al-Qaeda, which had been arrested by him and put in, put, put, put in prisons, and most importantly, the Redivision of Libya. Until 1931, Libya was Saranika in the east and Tripolitania in the west, with Benghazi and Tripoli as their capitals. Right. And the Italians united them into this kind of artificial state. The monarchy in the 50s was run out of Benghazi's, and the monarchy in the 50s, which Gaddafi overthrew, was actually the rule of Benghazi over all of this new Libya. And so this and, is the return of the repression. And initially, in many exactly, ways. and initially, and initially, Libya uh, under Gaddafi, he wanted a truly national government. When it became clear that wasn't possible, he then reasserted the rights of Tripoli over Benghazi. So, right. was, and this was really a civil war, and it was a civil war started in Benghazi by people who were, you know, those flags they carried that we all thought were so beautiful, flags of liberation, were the monarchist Benghazi flag from the 1950s. That was the flag they were flying. So we reignited with an ignorant West, not knowing what was going on, thinking again there was just a bunch of wonderful young liberals trained in Paris and London who were going to create a great democracy. And instead, we got the chaos that led to the murder of the American ambassador, to the uh, kidnapping of the prime minister, to uh, total chaos, which continues to reign today. Just this week, yeah. again, uh, in anticipation of new elections, parliament was raided, people were beaten up, people are being killed regularly. There is no uh, nation in Libya, there is no democracy in Libya, there is there's no justice in Libya. And there's no security for And most there's Libyans. certainly no security. There is, to be sure, no single tyrant. And for many, that will seem liberating. And maybe, you know, it's not for us to gain, say, history. That's where we are. But to pretend in the West that this is an improvement or that we have supported the forces of liberty and we now can watch uh, with satisfaction over the emergence of a democracy is just nonsense. Even Saif Gaddafi himself, captured by the Zintan militia years ago, was supposed to be turned over to Tripoli, and then they were going to turn him over to the court at The Hague. He is still a prisoner of the Zintan militia, which, and like the other militias, is basically running Libya in pieces. So, Professor Barber, this raises the obvious question. In the minds of a lot of people, particularly in the West, 
the state of chaos in which Libya finds itself today suggests that things were better off under Gaddafi and would be better off had he not been toppled. So my question to you is, as someone who worked with him a bit, who was in dialogue with him, and more importantly with his son, on this attempt yeah. to reform the country yeah. from within, gradually, yeah. how do you feel about this? Do you two, think that two simple things. One, it would never occur to me to say the world would be better off if a tyrant had not been toppled. So right. you know, the fact is he was toppled, and there were an awful lot of good things, and an awful lot of Libyans will tell you why you know, it, was, it was a good thing, and many of them... Amidst you know, the chaos. So, even with all, yeah, even, even so, a lot, a lot. So second of all, as I said to start with, you cannot do battle with history. That is what happened, what might have been. People write novels and movies about <laughs> World War II. What if the Nazis had won? <laughs> what if the Japanese Empire had succeeded in dominating? It's a fun fiction. The reality is Gaddafi was toppled with Western aid, with Western intervention. The reality is... Did you no oppose chaos. that intervention, by the way? I did. I did oppose the intervention because, because I opposed... If he couldn't be overthrown from within, and it required the introduction of Western arms, then it could not be seen as an indigenous revolution. So even in its own terms, it couldn't be. And the idea that he was going to massacre people, I mean, the Syrians have massacred so many more people. And indeed, more people have died. Well, that's gone on a lot longer, And more people too. have died into here. I mean, more people have died in other places. There was a threat that was used as a justification for, for an intervention. But I, it's, to me, the tyrant was overthrown. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. And the question now, and historically, this is where we are. So the question is what one does. And here's what bothers me. The West, so anxious to jump in and overthrow a tyrant and prove its liberal credentials, has completely disappeared. And what the Libyans now need is serious help, not in constructing a Supreme Court or a parliamentary government, but in constructing a civil society, in renewing their education institutions, in building out the internet. In other words, where now some serious aid in the civil side, in the economic side, could make a difference. The West has disappeared, having cheered on the people who destabilized the regime in the name, in the good name, of liberty. So I, I, I don't have any problem with the people internally who took to arms to overthrow a tyrant. I have a lot of problems with a cynical West that plays the liberty card and then walks away from the results when it doesn't turn out the way they said. So my quarrel is much more uh, with the United States, with France, with Italy, uh, and uh, with England for their encouragement of an overthrow. And of course, what's happened now, they've gotten gun shy in Syria, where you might say there's more reason to think they really should intervene. They're not intervening, and people are being slaughtered all over the place in numbers that totally eclipse the threat that Gaddafi had of slaughtering people in his own in his own country. So the hypocrisies of our own side in playing this game, and the same thing is true to just come to the present in Ukraine. Right. Because while in Ukraine, there's no question Putin is a bully, he's playing the politics to satisfy himself, there's also no question that the West is doing exactly the same thing. They are encouraging people in Western Ukraine, some of whom are ultra-nationalists, some of whom have a fascist heritage, some of whom are primarily interested in actually killing Russians and getting rid of the Russian language. And yet, we're the good guys, and the Russians trying to hang on to a small sector that is absolutely essential to their security and their domain are seen as the bad guys. And if you talk about this and write about this in the West, as my friend Stephen Cohen did in a wonderful article in The Nation last yeah, week about, about the Ukraine, you know, you quickly get in big trouble because we all have to be patriots for our own side. And so we read Ukraine through the lens of a pure West that is intervening only so the people there can be free and be uh, with us on the good side right. and see Putin purely in villainous terms that completely ignored both the valid national interests of the Russians, but also the Russian interest in protecting Russian speakers and those in the Ukraine. Because in fact, like Libya, there's no Ukraine, there's two Ukraines. There's a Western Ukrainian speaking part of Ukraine and there's a predominantly Russian eastern part of Ukraine, and in fact, if you did something reasonable, you'd probably divide the nation into two pieces. That's not going to happen, but that's right. what would probably reasonably happen. So the problem here, though, 
uh, Danny, and this is the problem we all have as social scientists, is we try to impose a screen of reason to filter these things and the historical realities, and we know this when we look back, but we never know it when it's happening right. right now, are far more problematic, far more cynical, far more poor power oriented, and of course, power is always the motive of the other side. Our side is interested only in virtue. Yeah. And that way of looking at the world satisfies the media, satisfies the patriots, satisfies nationalist tendencies. It does not, not satisfy the requirements of social science or history. Professor Barber, there's so much more to talk about, but thank you very well, much. Well, we'll do it again. Absolutely. Really nice to be here. Likewise, Thanks. likewise. That's excellent.